have very long, distinguished resumes, uh, but I want them to have as much time as possible, so I'm going to throw myself off the stage. Nancy Beck Young, an historian of the uh, 20th century American politics, teaches at the University of Houston. She has authored, author, uh, excuse me, authored three books, well, probably more than three now, but most importantly for us, this wonderful biography of uh, uh, Lou Henry Hoover, which is available in our store. And second, the second speaker will be Marilyn Holt, who worked as publications director at the Kansas State Historical Society, is an author of six books, particularly a specialist on the history of children in America, done wonderful work, many, many articles for historical journals. So first, uh, Nancy will come up and talk about Lou Henry Hoover, and then Marilyn will come up and talk about Mamie Eisenhower, and we'll leave a few minutes for questions, and we'll end about 4 o'clock. So, Nancy Beckham. I'd like to thank Tim and everyone at the Hoover Library for having me here for uh, this occasion. I truly, genuinely appreciate it. As I was listening to Iowa's First Ladies in the first session this afternoon, talking about some of the issues and challenges with regard to women in politics and women in public life, I was thinking how nicely Lou Henry Hoover's life fills uh, so many of those uh, niches. She had, uh, she had in her own family some of the secrets that you were talking about to get women involved in public life. She was the oldest of two children, both daughters, and her parents were very atypical of late 19th century parents of daughters <coughs> in that they did not assume that there were certain circumscribed roles to which their daughters should fill. Her mother and her father encouraged her in whatever pursuit she might choose, so she became an outdoors woman and knew no, knew no boundaries. She grew up, she was born and in, uh, initially raised in Iowa and ultimately moved out west to California with her parents as a young child. She earned a degree from a normal school but was not satisfied with that. She heard a lecture by an eminent geologist and was captivated by this new field and decided that she wanted to matriculate at Stanford University and study the subject further. She did, and she became one of the first women in the United States to earn a degree in geology, making her a pathbreaker. She also met Herbert Hoover at the time, also from Iowa, born the same year, 1874, and it was a match that was destined, I would say. Much earlier, when Lou was a young teenager, she wrote of the independent girl, and this is what she had to say. The independent girl is truly of quite modern origin and usually is a most bewitching little piece of humanity. She is an ambitious little personage who never asks for and seldom receives advice of any kind. But sooner or later she is sure to meet a spirit equally as independent as her own and then there is a clash of arms ending in mortal combat or they unite forces with combined strength to go forth and meet the world. <laughs> Now, she didn't know Bert Hoover when she wrote those words, but I think that that is a perfect quote to encapsulate the marriage that these two remarkable people had for so very many years. When Lou, Lou Henry, at that point in time, not yet married, when Lou Henry was graduating from Stanford, she found herself in a very difficult situation because she had taken this degree in this atypical subject for women and she wanted to go to work as a geologist. She wanted to go out in the field and she wanted to practice her profession. She wrote to one of her college friends about the dilemma that she faced because essentially no one would hire her because she was female. And she wrote to a friend, oh how I wish the AB stood for a boy as opposed to being my degree. That would solve all my problems. And when I read that letter in the archives a number of years ago when I was researching the book, I felt so badly for her. She had all this ambition, and her entire life she had been told she could do whatever she wanted. And as a young woman, she was being told by the larger society, no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> 
she adapted and she found a way to channel her energies and talents not through a paid professional career, but she nonetheless became an unpaid professional woman, I would argue, in her adult life. She married Bert. He proposed in the most unromantic way possible that I can imagine via telegram. <laughs> so it was short and it was sweet. But it worked, and it worked for so very many years. They married, and they immediately moved to China where his career took them, and they traveled the world together. In their earliest years together, she was focused on helping advance his career, learning the Chinese language, later helping relocate to London, and being a mother, raising her sons. The First World War intervened and changed the nature of the Hoover's life together, and their intersection with American history. In 1914, when the Great War began, Bert Hoover was approached to oversee the Committee for the Relief of Belgium, Belgium having been overrun by the Germans and the Belgian people being without food or the ability for resupply. Mrs. Hoover, stationed in London, worked very hard initially with the relief of stranded American tourists, helping them get funds to return to the United States because they might have converted their currency, etc., and had no easy means of transport back home. And so that involved her organizational skills, and she proved quite adept at that. She also toured the United States giving speeches to help raise money for the relief of the Belgian people. Fast forward three years to 1917 and the United States entry into the war. Bert Hoover is invited by President Wilson to come back to the United States and run the Food Administration. Lou Henry Hoover becomes equally <laughs> active in helping to mitigate the living conditions of females who had moved to Washington, D.C. alone, uh, unmarried females, I should say, who were working as clerks in the Food Administration and helped to mitigate their living circumstances and their social lives, etc., proving again her activist and organizational abilities. During the war years, she became also aware of the burgeoning scouting movement and specifically the Girl Scouting movement so that by the end of the war she was starting to volunteer in Girl Scouting. And there's another conduit to women's activism and public life at least earlier in the 20th century and I think this sort of activism could continue to be a conduit for uh, future generations of women to enter public life. So she became uh, first at the local level and then ultimately ultimately at the national level very involved in Girl Scouting and worked in that regard for, uh, for the overwhelming, uh, for, 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 well for the remainder of her life. But she became president of the National Girl Scouts during the 1920s and really helped take this organization that was uh, was born uh, born uh, very recently uh, from a, an informal organization to a professional modern organization. She was a member of a host of uh, different women's voluntary organizations, and that's something that you should know about your history of the 1920s if you don't. This was a, a decade in which Americans were joiners. They joined uh, all, all the lodges and the social fraternities and the garden clubs and the literary clubs and, and whatnot. And Lou Henry Hoover was if Americans were joiners in the 1920s, then Lou Henry Hoover was the master joiner because uh, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of boxes of correspondence uh, between Mrs. Hoover and the various organizations of which she was a part. But Girl Scouts was the organization with which uh, she had the most, uh, the, the most uh, involvement and uh, interest and, and, and whatnot. So by the mid to late 1920s, as Herbert Hoover's political star was rising on the national scene, his work with the Department of Commerce, he had been Depart Commerce Secretary throughout the decade, 
talk is, is growing about a, a potential Hoover presidency. What would that mean for Lou Henry Hoover? And actually, it seemed to me that initially the move to the White House with Herbert's election in 1928 limited Lou Henry Hoover in some way. She had less freedom to be an independent woman living within the fishbowl of the White House than she had had in the previous decade of the 1920s. She had crafted a space in which she could be an autonomous woman working with Girl Scouts, working with women's athletics, and working with her various other interests. But the White House put restrictions on her. And what I want to do is I want to take the rest of my time to focus my talk on how she dealt with those restrictions and nonetheless became an innovative activist first lady, accomplishing many notable firsts that most people typically associate with Eleanor Roosevelt, not Lou Henry Hoover. If you went and did a random survey and asked who was the first first lady, for example, to speak on the radio or to give press conferences or to advocate a civil rights cause or to adopt a political program from the White House, you would probably hear the answer of Eleanor Roosevelt. And that would be an incorrect answer. The person who gave all of those answers, putting on my professor's hat now, would earn a zero on the exam. Because Lou Henry Hoover actually did all of those things before Eleanor Roosevelt. She did them in such a way that blended past and what was for her present in the late 20s, early 1930s. I make the argument in the book that she was a transitional figure in the history of both the institution of the First Lady and in the history of the uh, emergence of, of modern women. She was transitional between the Victorian notions of how a proper and a respectable woman should behave and how that has evolved in the 20th century. In the way that she entertained in the White House, she really shook up the Washington social scene. There were certain expectations, uh, for example, long formal receiving lines, very staid, where the, the hosts stood like automatons, shook hands, and the crowd moved on through. And that didn't seem to be very hospitable to Lou Henry Hoover, who was well known for being a gracious entertainer. She thought that guests at the White House would get more out of their experience if they could be broken up into small groups. And so she found ways to rearrange the seating and rearrange the greeting and the mingling patterns and whatnot to accomplish that. The journalists had a field day. They criticized, you know, how dare she? This is not the way it's done. And the old guard of Washington society was equally skeptical, looking down their nose and all that sort of thing at, at, at what was going on. Mrs. Hoover inherited a social secretary who had served Grace Coolidge and had been in the White House previously. And Mary Randolph is the name of this social secretary. Mary Randolph ha cautioned Mrs. Hoover to be careful and not rush her jumps, that she was making too much change too fast. Well, Lou Henry Hoover didn't worry too much about this criticism. She had larger plans and a larger agenda at stake here, and she realized that her functioning as First Lady would continue to be on a parallel track with her husband's functioning as President, much as their life together had been ever since they married uh, so, many, so many years before. And she understood that she could use those old-fashioned, if you will, responsibilities as White House hostess for political purposes. In our jaundiced, cynical, 
perspective from the early 21st century, we would sit and think, well, of course, entertaining at the White House is for political purposes. Why else do they do it? But at the time that the Hoovers moved to the White House, the entertaining was less political. But Mrs. Hoover would carefully oversee guest lists and make sure that opposing senators got equal time at the White House dinner table. When the Depression hit and worsened, she viewed the entertaining responsibilities as a way to maintain her husband's spirits, make sure that there were enough people at the dinner table that would discuss things that would be of interest to him, that would not be a drain on him given all of the criticism and problems that he faced. The best example, though, of her political awareness as a hostess comes very early in the Hoover administration, and it comes from one of those old-fashioned responsibilities that the First Lady had. The First Lady, among other things, was to host a series of teas for spouses of the members of Congress, members of the House, members of the Senate. And typically the First Lady had had one large tea with all 500, however many, you know, account for the bachelors, account for the widowers, uh, but however many spouses were actually in Washington, D.C., and there would be this one mass tea, and the ladies would troop through, and there would be that long receiving line that I had mentioned to you. 1929 posed an especial challenge, because something happened in the United States in 1928 that had not happened for... Since, since, since Reconstruction, and that was the election of an African American to Congress. From one of the districts in Chicago, one Oscar Stanton de Priest was elected to Congress, and Oscar Stanton de Priest was an African American married to an African American. His wife, Jesse de Priest, was due an invitation to the first tea at the White House, right, as being a member of Congress's uh, being the spouse of a member of Congress. Now, this is problem enough in late 20s America. It's more of a problem if you will remember Herbert Hoover's political strategy. Herbert Hoover had a southern strategy long before Richard Nixon ever thought about running for the presidency and using a similar sort of approach. Herbert Hoover hoped that Southern politics could be yet again reconstructed with party divisions being drawn more along economic lines and less <coughs> along racial lines. And so he had made an appeal to the South with that regard. A tea at which Mrs. DePriest was a guest could throw a serious monkey wrench into President Hoover's plans. So the planning for this tea needed to occur with the greatest of care. <coughs> Mrs. Hoover broke up the guest list. Instead of holding one large tea, Mrs. Hoover held a series of teas. The guest list for most of the teas was large, 100, 150, maybe 200 people. Guests were being screened as they didn't even realize it. Has this person been raised well? Does this person have good manners? Can this person be counted upon to behave well when thrown into a unique situation if one views socializing with an African American as a unique situation, which unfortunately for many Americans in the late 20s would have been. Okay. On the day of the next to the last tea, an invitation was delivered by secret messenger to Mrs. DePriest. The messenger was told not to open the envelope, reveal the mission, or otherwise discuss anything that he was doing on that day with anyone. The messenger kept it zipped. No one learned of this last much smaller tea with a, 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 an intimate group of women before its staging. After its occurrence, the press knew all about it. 
And the nastiest, vilest letters were written to Mrs. Hoover from Americans North and South. I don't want to quote but use your worst imaginations should you care to guess the language and you won't even come close. A, a, a G version, if there is such a thing, of the sort of criticism written to Lou Henry Hoover would be the one letter writer who said the White House was for white people. That's a G version of what was written to Lou Henry Hoover. Several southern state legislatures passed resolutions of condemnation, including Texas. So, it was truly an ugly, ugly flare-up. Mrs. Hoover was terribly hurt and troubled by this. But it did not stop her from pursuing an activist agenda for the remainder of her years in Washington. There are a couple of other examples that are important to understanding Lou Henry Hoover that I'd like to share with you. One was her ability to discover a problem and just get busy trying to solve it without any fanfare, because that's an important, an important point to remember if you're trying to understand the Hoovers. They didn't like a lot of extra attention drawn to themselves, which makes them very atypical when considering the political history of American leaders. They built a retreat for themselves in the mountains of Virginia, you may or may not be aware of this, so that they could escape the heat of Washington, D.C. This uh, retreat was called Camp Rapidan, and it actually Lou Henry Hoover played a key role in designing the camp. She was an amateur architect among her many other accomplishments in life. And early in their visits to Camp Rapidan, they discovered the poverty of the residents of that part of Appalachia. And they discovered the fact that the children who lived in the nearest community had no school easily accessible to them. So from their own money and through their contacts, they raised even more money to build a school called the President's Mountain School. They made sure that very few journalists wrote about their endeavors and certainly about their funding of the school. Their view of philanthropy was that if you used your philanthropic <laughs> acts for political purpose, if you publicized your philanthropy, it ceased being philanthropy. It became something else. And that you don't do a good deed so that someone will come up to you on the street and say, that was a really nice thing that you did. You do a good deed because there's this work that needs to be done. But they screened the teacher. They made sure that she was familiar with the problems that Appalachian people mired in generational poverty faced. They made sure that the teacher would not only work well with the children, but could also be a, a, a social worker, if you will, for the parents and the problems that they would have. Because you see, this settlement would be closed down in a few years as that, that territory became a part of, uh, 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 of, of the national park system. And so the people were going to be moving out in four, five, six, seven, eight years, and they needed to be ready to mix it up in the, in the wider world. And the school was to serve part of that purpose. Now, initially, the construction of this school was an act of private philanthropy, nothing, nothing more, nothing less from the perspective of the Hoovers. But as the country spiraled into the Great Depression, it took on a depression relief component as well. And that's not the end of Lou Henry Hoover's involvement in depression relief. Americans look upon first ladies as someone to whom they can pour out their troubles. And such letters were sent to Lou Henry Hoover on a daily basis. Before the market crash and before the worsening of the financial problems, the letters would often be handled at the secretarial level with Lou Henry Hoover never even seeing them. And the letter writers would be told, well, you, I hope that you voted for Mr. Hoover because you thought he was the best man to run the country, not because you expected any sort of favor from the White House. I'm not going to trouble Mrs. Hoover by even showing her your letter. It would distress her so much. And so the responses were really rather curt and uh, such that you cannot imagine being written from a White House 
again in our jaded, cynical 21st century. But such letters were written until the country's economic problems <coughs> deteriorated to the point of uh, to, to the point of no return, a quarter unemployment, etc. The letters increased. Lou Henry Hoover developed out of the East Wing of the White House an informal network of relief. Remember, she is unelected. She has no constitutional expectations placed upon her and very little in the way of staff to support her efforts. She does expand the size of her staff directly within the White House and indirectly through her connections in women's voluntary culture. If a person writes in for a particular community with a problem, the children, my children cannot afford to continue to go to school if our family does not receive some sort of a help. If there was a Girl Scout troop in that town, then Lou Henry Hoover would use her contacts in Girl Scouting to make sure that the request was valid. If the request was valid, let's say the children needed shoes to go to school. If the request was valid, then the local Girl Scout troop would be set to work raising money to ensure that those four children, or however many children the family had, got shoes so that they could go to school at the next school year. If uh, the concern was of a health matter, then whatever the most appropriate voluntary contact was, was reached and, uh, and uh, asked to investigate the situation. And so this very informal, this very informal network of, of activism was constructed in the East Wing. Nonetheless, incredibly, incredibly significant, suggesting Lou Henry Hoover's deep involvement in the policy process of the Hoover White House. And these are some of the stories that made her such a fascinating woman to me when I was researching and writing her life. When the Hoovers left the White House, she continued to be an activist, working with causes as diverse as conservative women's political activism with groups like Pro-America, a right-wing women's political group in the middle of the 20th century, to Friends of Music at Stanford University, to uh, still her beloved Girl Scouts. Lou Henry Hoover was an activist first lady who deserves much more attention from scholars than she has yet received. And with that, I will stop. <laughs>
congenial suburban housewife, member of the garden club, fun-loving grandmother. <clears throat> In many ways, Mamie Eisenhower was Mrs. Average America. Like thousands of Americans in post-war America, she wanted to own a house. All of their married life, she and Ike never owned their own home until they purchased the property of Gettysburg. Mamie was average in many ways because, well, she liked to watch I Love Lucy. She loved to watch soap operas. Uh, J.B. West again complained that you never went to see Mrs. Eisenhower when As the World Turns was on because then you get trapped up there watching it with her. She liked to play cards with her friends. Uh, she sat by and watched Ike do his man chef thing on the barbecue. But it never seemed to register with the public that her life experiences based on a military life were not those of most women. She had lived on army bases in the United States. She had lived in Panama, the Philippines, and Paris. Actually, they lived in Paris twice. The first in the late 1920s when Ike was assigned to uh, the, Amer the American Battle uh, Field Commission. And then in the 1940s when Ike went back after the Second World War, when NATO was organized. So she had a, a very expanded world view based on the military experience. Her adult life was spent in this military culture that had its own hierarchy and its own expectations. When the husband advances in rank, so does the wife. Women accepted the idea that they could not guarantee their husband's success, but they could harm it. And army wives like Mamie knew that they could be a detriment if they didn't measure up. Mamie told an interviewer that a woman could make things difficult for the husband if she was a troublemaker, a gossip, or she didn't know how to do things properly. In one instance, for example, Mamie found it difficult to believe that an acquaintance of Ike's had been promoted because this man's wife, and these are Mamie's words, the wife was simply awful. <laughs> Mamie saw herself as a partner in Ike's career, and many of those close to the Eisenhowers believed that she was an important ally. One of Ike's presidential speech writers said that Ike would have been Colonel Dwight D. Eisenhower if it had not been for Mamie. My book on Mamie Eisenhower, as was mentioned earlier, is part of the Modern First Lady series by the University Press of Kansas. And one of the underlying themes, of course, is the role of First Lady and how individual women have approached that role and how they have shaped it. Mamie brought her experiences as an army wife to the White House. And if anything, she felt confident that she was better prepared than others might have been to carry out the duties of First Lady. In part, it's because she had been living around Washington, off and on since the late 20s, depending on Ike's assignments. And while they were in the Washington area, and because of Ike's level of uh, rank, Mamie had been a guest in the White House during four previous administrations. The first was the Hoover administration. And then she had that military culture to fall back on, which had prepared her for, I think, just about everything. And J.B. West, again, says, As the wife of a career Army officer, Mamie Eisenhower knew exactly what she wanted, every moment, and exactly how it should be done. It was as if it were she who had been the five-star general. She established her White House command immediately. Behind the Mamie Pink and the Mamie Bangs, that we all associate her with, and that very outgoing personality 
she was a very hard-working first lady. Now, there's no job description for what women are supposed to do, but we have certain expectations. And Mamie set very high standards for herself. And at the same time, it seems to me that she downplayed her efforts and her contributions. Mamie Eisenhower's dedication to doing her best was overshadowed by the image that she helped to perpetuate, that of a woman spending her time in bed. Now, how many of you have heard these stories? Okay. Some of you are willing to admit it, but I've had people come up to me and say, Oh, I know all about Mamie. She was just in bed all the time. <laughs> well, she did playfully advise women, including her own daughter-in-law and granddaughters, to pamper themselves and spend time in bed. And that's often what people remember. Not that one of her White House projects was completion of the collection of presidential china in the White House China Room, or that when she was honorary chairman of the American Heart Association, there was a drastic rise in donations and volunteers. As for staying in bed, well, yes, the first two or three hours in the morning, she stayed in bed. And part of that has to do not with pampering yourself, but because of her heart condition, and the problems she had with equilibrium, the Meniere's disease. And from bed, she would meet with the head housekeeper, the usher, her secretary. She would dictate letters. She would go over the event schedule for the day. And she went over every detail, flowers, menu, guest list, and truly, not since Lou Hoover had been in the White House could you find a more detail-oriented First Lady. Now, this morning ritual was followed by all these public obligations, and I, I just want to mention one of those many obligations, at least an obligation as far as Mamie saw her role, and that was the special tour. These are receptions and tour groups that come in because there's been a request, sometimes from a congressman, oftentimes because just what the organization is. Republican women, DAR. In Mamie's case, it also included the uh, National Association of Negro Women, and the list went on and on. Early in 1953, just a few months after she was in the White House, Mamie wrote a friend. Every day I have groups of ladies coming in by the two and three hundreds. In one five-day period, she figured that she had shaken about 6,000 hands. And she just didn't shake hands and go on to the next person in the line. She had something to say to each and every person. And I think this is something very admirable about Mamie in terms of just trying to make this person-to-person -person connection. One observer wrote, Mrs. Eisenhower could charm the socks off anybody she met. Now, Mamie also had this gift for remembering names and faces. During the Mamie Eisenhower centennial at the Eisenhower Presidential Library in Abilene, a story was told about a woman who came to a reception. Now, she had been to others, and she had heard that Mamie had this great memory, decided to test it, got to the end of the reception line, you know, working her way up from the back. And when she got up to shake hands with Mamie, Mamie looked at her and said, What? You're here again? <laughs> <laughs> Newsweek magazine estimated that during her first four years in the White House, Mamie Eisenhower personally shook hands with 100,000 people. And believe me, this is no exaggeration. Going through the records of the White House social office, you see again and again special groups, special tours, and she made it so easy, and yet many times at the end of the day, her feet were swollen, her legs were swollen, her hands and her arms. At one point, I tried to get her to stop, and he wrote, she insists on talking to everyone. It's a strain. 
But this is one thing he couldn't keep her from doing. In writing the book on Mamie, I spent about a year and a half with her. Sometimes she was demanding. She was certainly a perfectionist. She was opinionated. And oftentimes she was amusing and fun-loving. And during this time I spent with Mamie, I caught a glimpse of this older woman trying to offer the benefit of her experience to someone younger. You certainly see this in her relationship with Pat Nixon, including her in White House functions and social events, entertaining uh, her and introducing her to close friends. There's no doubt that Mamie was sure that Pat Nixon in the future would be a first lady. Mamie also, you see this uh, younger woman, older woman dynamic in a 1975 interview she did with Barbara Walters. Now during the interview, Walters asked Mamie if her marriage to Ike had ever been in jeopardy. Now of course what Barbara is trying to refer to ever so obliquely is the possibility of Ike having an affair with Kay Summersby. Well, Mamie just, you know, she's not going to answer that and so she just sticks with the question, has your marriage ever been in jeopardy? And it's as if Mamie reaches over and almost takes Barbara Walters by the hand. And she becomes, you know, the counselor, the instructor. You can almost hear her say, now look, honey. <laughs> Which she doesn't do in the interview. But what she says is, kind of leaning in, all marriages are in jeopardy. That's where your good sense comes in. And it's like she's telling Walters, now, would you write this down and remember it? You may need this information. In the years since Mamie Eisenhower's residence in the White House, the usual attitude among writers and historians has been to dismiss her as an aged grandmother. Now, Mamie was 56 years old when she went in the White House, and since I'm in my 50s, I resent being thought of as an age grandmother. But now historians looking back don't really do the math, I think. And yes, she was older when she came out of the White House, but she was 56 when she went in. And many times, the way that she's represented as too ill, too out of date, to offer anything positive to the role of First Lady. And while reappraisal of Ike's presidency in the last few years has elevated, and there's been a growing appreciation for him and his policies, Mamie has not shared in this upswing. Why? Well, certainly part of the reason is the phenomenal place that Jacqueline Kennedy occupies in American memory and culture. But it seems to me that there's more to the question than simply to say that while Mamie was more involved as a first lady than Bess Truman, she wasn't as glamorous or socially sophisticated as her successor Jacqueline Kennedy. Now rather than belabor who had more style, because Mamie certainly had style, the American fashion industry loved Mamie because she helped raise them out of the doldrums. She was a, a wonderful poster child for American fashion in the 50s. But rather than belabor who was more sophisticated, Jackie or Mamie, I think we need to look at the time period and how our perceptions of a first lady changes. Mamie was a perfect fit for the 1950s, but not for the latter part of the 19, uh, 20th century when the new women's movement had its impact on social thinking and behavior. The women's movement stressed total equality at home and in the workplace, and being a less visible partner was equivalent to sexual inequality. And Mamie's ideas about marriage as a partnership, and a partnership in which each partner had certain responsibilities, and one didn't stray across the line into the other. Now, 
During the 1950s, the media helped create this stereotype of the domestic woman at home. I mean, let's think about it. Father knows best, leave it to beaver, all those advertisements where the woman is just thrilled with her new washing machine. <laughs> but these stereotypes overlook the fact that American society was changing and more women were going into the workplace full or part time. And certainly in the Eisenhower administration, you see women in public office. Um, as a matter of fact, while the Eisenhowers were in, Ike was in office and Mamie was in the White House, 175 women held high level federal posts, either as heads of federal agencies, U.S. ambassadors, and that doesn't even include the women that were elected to Congress during this period. So, what did Mamie, the consummate homemaker, think of women in the workplace? Well, she was asked that question after she left the White House, and her reply was direct. If a woman wants to express herself outside the home, or if the budget, need, budget needs the outside income for extra luxuries, only the woman can make that choice herself. Mamie Eisenhower was not an activist in the mode of First Ladies Lou Hoover and Eleanor Roosevelt, although she did employ the same mechanism as Ike, that hidden hand presidency, call it a hidden hand First Lady ship, perhaps, because she worked behind the scenes. Lucille Ball, who had been brought up before McCarthy hearings, she and Desi are invited to the White House. Ostensibly, they are entertaining at Ike's birthday party. But the timing just happens to be after Lucille Ball has been called before the committee. So behind the scenes, she's doing things, but she's certainly not an activist like Mrs. Hoover or Mrs. Roosevelt. And she's certainly not the kind of first lady that we see in Rosalind Carter or in Hillary Clinton, women who sat in on cabinet meetings and helped formulate policy. Mamie always tried to keep her household and Ike's work separate. She never went to the West Wing unless she was invited, and in eight years, that was only four times. Despite the ways in which Mamie Eisenhower has been evaluated or ignored, she was a very popular first lady. And for the most part, I think that the reason she was popular then and remained popular in the post-presidential years was because of that connection people made with her in 1952 as just the neighbor next door. And some level, on some level, Mamie understood this because when she was asked by Barbara Walters in 1979 how she would like to be remembered, she said, just as a good friend. I've been asked what surprised me about Mamie. Maybe, maybe surprise isn't the right word, except to say that I was struck by how often the reporters and journalists really got Mamie right portrayed her personality and its different aspects with such accuracy. One reporter, 1953, wrote, it has been obvious for a long time that all Mamie Eisenhower has to do to sell herself to the press or the public is just to be herself. And this is my favorite one, also from uh, 1952, the election. Life magazine article speculated on what sort of first lady Mamie Eisenhower would be. Mamie Eisenhower, it said, had the highly commendable dignity of Bess Truman with a touch of Ethel Merman on the side. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is the perfect description, as is the obituary written by Miriam Bo uh, Christie for the Boston Globe. Mamie Eisenhower had the courage to define herself rather than have outsiders tell her who she was and what she should be. 
She set an image for the role of the classic wife, the classic mother, the classic non-political president's wife. She had the guts to be her classic self. Thank <laughs> you.